face today, he overcomes it all. He's the great I am. He's the all-powerful one. This speaks about how powerful and great he is. No matter what you're facing, you stand with him today, victorious. Here we go. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise for. All right, keep it going. Our God, like it. You guys sound good. Look at somebody and say, man, you can sing and clap at the same time. <laughs> oh, it's great to have you guys here. We have a brand new song we're going to teach you this morning. Uh, not new to many of you in the room if you listen to any kind of contemporary music, but uh, new to us. Just talking about what I love about Jesus is that I may be, at times in my life, feel pretty defeated or feel like I'm beaten down. But with Jesus in my corner, I'm always a champion. Right? Amen? But I'm not a champion because of what I do. I'm a champion because of what he has done. Through him, we are champions. Through him, we're overcomers. Through him, we are victorious. And no matter what you're facing today, no matter how hard it may seem, just like he's an unstoppable God, he is your champion today. He is the one who fights for you. He, the one, he is the one who comes alongside you and brings you the victory, not because of who you are, but because of who he is and what he has done. This song is, You Are My Champion. I tried so hard to see it. Took me so long to see someone like me to carry your victory perfection could never earn it you give what we don't deserve and you take the broken things and raise them to glory you are my champion Giants fall when we stand undefeated. Every battle you won. I am who you say I am. You crown me with confidence. I am seated in the heavenly place undefeated. 
touch those lives. For those struggling today, may they find hope in you this day before they leave here. And may they know that Jesus, you have them in your hands. So God, go with us and let us hear from your word next few moments of time as we learn more and more about how to handle the loving people in our lives, the people around us to not take and drain the life from us, God. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Thank you for worshiping today.
I brace myself. I know who is about to enter in a few seconds. A plumber can't fix the drain that's about to hit me. Jake! Jake, you have to help me, Jake! This is Peter Beggart. To say he's needy is an understatement. He always has a problem, and no matter how trivial, it's always a big one. So what's the matter? My life is a mess. When isn't it? I, I don't know what to do. I've tried everything. How about not whining? Everybody, everybody's against me, Jake. You're my only friend. I sometimes think my life would be so much better if it wasn't for those people. We are in our second week of this series called Relational Vampires. Turn to your neighbor and say, Vampires. Yeah. It's that time of the year we talk about ghouls and goblins and vampires, and I'm not trying to glorify them whatsoever. This is relational vampires are the, 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 loving, the people that we love in our lives, but they kind of suck the life right out of us. You know what I'm talking about. You know who they are, uh, whatever they look like. You know where they may be today. They might be sitting with you. You might have left them at home because you couldn't bring them to church because they sucked the life out of you, so you just left them at home. Uh, whatever it is, today I want to continue on this series where we're looking at different kinds of people that suck the life out of us. We learned last week about critical people, people that no matter what you do, they always seem to have a critical comment. They always seem to think they know better than what you do, and they think that they have an upper hand or they can see it better than you can, um, and they can come at you critically. I'm not talking about constructive. I'm talking about not talking about people who want the best for you and want to build you up. I'm talking about just negative people. Maybe your parents. It might be a, a boss or a co-worker. I don't know what it is for you, but you know who they are and uh, how to cope with them. I, we talked about that last week. If you missed it, go online. You can watch it and catch up on last week's message dealing with critical people. And also talked about if you're critical yourself, how do you have the Holy Spirit help you navigate that critical spirit inside of you? Uh, and then we're going to talk about manipulative people people that manipulate, people that try to control. Uh, we're going to talk about today. One of the subjects today is, of course, dealing with needy people. Um, and this is one that I think is going to be eye-opening to some of you and others of you. Uh, maybe you'll be able to kind of see where I'm going with this today, talking about needy people. Now, let me just say right at the very beginning of this message that as Christians, we are to help those in need, right? If, if people are hurting in life, we're to help them. We're to offer them hope. If people are struggling in a certain season of their life, we're to do what we can to encourage them, to build them up. Uh, there, we're there to, to be the hands and feet of Jesus with anyone that is in, uh, in need at any case. Um, and there's very real needs. There's very real relationships that are broken there's very real financial struggles that hit a family uh, from out in left field and really hit them hard. Uh, there's very real needs with marriages that are broke down and need healing. There's very real needs. So I'm not talking today about real needs. If you have real needs today, it doesn't mean that you're an, a, a, an overly needy person. And that's what I want to talk about today. How do we deal with these people in our lives that are what I call habitually needy? right? Overly, overly needy. Like they constantly need some kind of affirmation. They constantly need financial services. They constantly need your attention. And they constantly need you to tell, you, tell them how great they are and how wonderful they are. And they're constantly overly needy people. Anybody know anyone like that, not making eye contact, looking up here at me, know somebody like that, overly needy people? Any of you overly needy people here today? Oh, <laughs> thank you for your honesty. I appreciate that. We'll pray. Book was written uh, several years ago called Emotional Vampires. And it talks about the different kinds of people in our lives that really draw a lot of energy out of us and really draw a lot of life out of us when we could be giving it to other places. Um, and this book, I'll summarize, Four different kinds of emotional vampires. You have your notes? Crack them out. You're going to want to follow along with this because you're going to see this play out in your life. If you haven't already, trust me, you will. Four categories of emotional vampires. First, number one, is the incredibly, incurably insecure 
people. They are just so insecure about who they are. They just are the ones that'll come up and say, hey, how you doing? Doing good. And then five minutes later, come back and say, are we okay? Are we good? Everything all right between us? I, I want to make sure that I say something to offend you, that I hurt your feelings in some way. These are the incurably, are you angry with me? This, was it the post? <laughs> I didn't comment on the post. Is that what it is? Is that what it is? Incurably insecure people. You may know somebody like that. Number two, second kind of, of uh, uh, emotional vampires are drama kings and drama queens. You know these people, they blow everything out of proportion. Everything's a big deal, right? It doesn't matter how small or how minor. It's a huge deal. You won't believe what happened to me. It's the worst day ever. It's the worst job ever. He's the worst boyfriend ever. In fact, ever for them is spelt with three V's. Ever, 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 ever. It's, a, it's so overly dramatic. Everything, uh, just drama, drama, drama. Anybody know any drama queens or kings in the house? Are you all going to participate? Some of you are not raising your hand. You know who, I know some of you, you should raise your hand. I know who you're married to, so you need to get that hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, nobody in here, nobody here. All right, this next one, emotional uh, vampire, are the blabbers, the blabbers, the blah, 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 Charlie Brown, wah, 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 wah. I mean, these are the people that you're telling your, you're telling your story and they interrupt you with their story because their story is bigger than your story. They're story stackers, story stackers. Remember that word. They have to one up your story or they know somebody that has the same thing you have, right? Oh, well, I know exactly who that is. Oh, that's just like so. Blabbers, blah, blah, blah. Hey, you know Meg. No, I don't know Meg. You know Meg. Meg and Sally. Meg and Sally. Well, anyway, she's related to so and so and so and so. And oh, it's just their drama is so high, right? Blabbers, drama queens, drama kings incurably insecure. And the last one, the financial leeches. The financial leeches in life. I'm not talking about just a every now and then or once in a great moon financially struggling. I'm talking about these people are always hurting financially and they want you to help them in their finances. This is this is vacation. What's his name? On Christmas vacation. What is his name? Huh? Eddie. Cousin Eddie. I couldn't remember. I blanked his name. Cousin, this is Cousin Eddie. Cousin Eddie shows up, you know. He's looking for money. Financial leeches in life. They're always in a habitual place of financial struggle. So we have these four different kinds, incurably insecure, drama queens, and kings. Don't know why it just says queens. I promise I had kings in my notes. They did not include it. Kings and blabbers and financial leeches or freeloaders. Um, so we have these kind of vampires in our lives. The question that we had come to as Christians is, what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to handle them? How are we supposed to negotiate between the tension. What's the tension? The tension is if we have a means in which we can do something, we're called by Christ to help out in some way. But not everyone that comes, comes in our life are we supposed to help out. Now, that's the tension right there. We can, but maybe we're not supposed to. And this is exactly what Jesus had to deal with, um, partly himself. Um, we, we have the right amount but what is the right amount of assistance that we need to give to someone in need? What is, what is just enough and what is too much? What brings them victory and what brings them a handicap? Where does it happen? Does anybody relate with that tension of knowing like what to do and you should do something, but you don't know what it is and you're kind of limited? Yeah. 
We all struggle with that tension that comes on in life, and Jesus did too. Don't believe me? Let's read Matthew chapter 9. Open your Bibles. Matthew chapter 9, um, verse 30, uh, 35, 36, 36. It says, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with what? He was what? Moved with? Compassion. Okay, let's do that better. He was moved with? Compassion. He was something inside of him was moving him, not just to one or two people, not just to three or four or to 10, but the multitudes would be many, hundreds, thousands. He saw many people and he was moved with compassion. Why? Because they were what? They were weary and scattered like a sheep having no shepherd. Let's pray. Father, help us today to deal with the tension that comes in in dealing with people. The tension of knowing when just the right amount is given. Because, God, we are called to help and we are called to engage and we're called to, to help people out in life. But, God, we don't want to handicap them. We want to do just the right amount. So help us today discover how to overcome this tension. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. Jesus was moved with compassion. That word in the Greek, I'm not going to give you the Greek word because it really doesn't matter. What matters is what it means. What it means is when moved with compassion, it actually is this intense earning from deep within, and they would say the bowels. Like, you and I think that's gross, like the bowels. But in those days, the deepest emotion you would say when you love someone, I love you with my bowels. That meant a lot back in the day. It's lost its meaning over the years, right? So this is the tension, and so it comes from deep within, an intense movement from within to, to be moved with something, to do something about what is happening around you. Understand this. Jesus cared more for anyone else who ever lived Jesus cared more than anybody else who ever existed. Jesus cared more than we would ever care for. You think you love your kids? Jesus loves them more. You think you love your dog? Jesus loves him, sort of. You think you love your cat? Story's over. Forget it. <laughs> Jesus cared more. <laughs> Jesus cared more than anyone else who walked this planet. But Jesus, get this, Jesus did not heal everyone, and he did not grant every request that came his way. And that is the tension. The one who loved us more than anything else, but yet he did not heal every single person that came his way or grant every request that came his way. That's the tension. The tension is, what are we supposed to do? How much do we engage? How deep do we go? Jesus could have healed every sick person in the multitudes, but he didn't. He only healed, in fact, Scripture in one passage says he only healed a few but he could have healed many more. Why didn't he? Because there lies the tension. What is our goal? Our goal is this. How do we help without enabling people? How do we help without paralyzing people to be stuck in the place where maybe God doesn't want them to be, and the only way they come out of it is for them to turn their trust and attentions over to God? How do we, how do we help without enabling. I want to give you three thoughts and a few sub points to go along with those three thoughts. Here's thought number one. How do we help? We offer them what they need, not what they want. We offer them what they need, not what they want. Acts tells a story sort of like this. It's actually a great illustration for what you need versus what you, what you need versus what you want. And basically, let me give you the backstory here. Um, this is uh, 
After the day of Pentecost, this is whenever the disciples had had the power of the Holy Spirit come upon them, and they're going around, they're teaching, and they're they're doing miracles. I mean, miracles are happening everywhere they go. They are so filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And as they're moving through life, and as they're doing life, they come upon these gates where there's a man who was crippled since birth. He'd been collecting money from passerbyers ever since he was little. It's all he knew. It's all he knew how to do. But what happened was Peter comes upon him. And Peter, in Acts chapter 3, verse 6 and 7, it says, Peter looks at him, he says this, he says, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have, I'm going to give to you. I'm going to give you what you need, not what you want. What did he want? He wanted the silver and gold. But Peter said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Then this is key. Taking him by the right hand, what did he do? He what? Say it with me. He What did he do? He helped him up. Notice, notice that what the man wanted versus what he needed were two different things. Now, in our opinions, looking back, we would say he got a better thing, right? Because he got to walk. And we're like, what a great miracle. But think about this. For this man... He had a pretty okay life, even though he couldn't walk. He had money given to him for doing nothing. But Jesus, but Peter thought, you know what? The best thing for this man is to give him ability to walk, and then he can make his own silver and gold. What did he want? He wanted silver and gold. What did he need? He needed portability. He needed the ability to be able to walk. Why is this important? Because the fact is, sometimes in life, we give hands out, handouts, and we never help them up. We have a population in this country, ever growing, of handouts instead of a help up. Abraham Lincoln said, give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. Give a, teach a man to fish, you feed him for what? A lifetime. What was that saying? That was saying, listen, if you're capable, get up, walk, and you will live a better life. What they need, not what they want. Whenever Lily was little, Lily, had, Tyler's never enjoyed uh, pop, uh, never enjoyed soda in any way, shape, form, and burns his throat. He don't like it. And so he's never really had a a pop thing, but my daughter, I swear, I don't know, she came out drinking it from the umbilical cord. It was like, (laughs) she likes her pop, man. She likes her Cokes. And and so when she was little, she was having a hard time sleeping, and she would be up late at night. She'd struggle with some, some, of course, some anxieties and fears about what the next day was going to hold and everything like that. Well, we discovered that also we were (laughs) giving her pop too late in the evening. And that made her a little bit more wired, a little bit more caffeinated to where her mind would go. And so we had to cut out the pop and replace it with something else. Why? Because it's what she needed, but trust me, she wanted pop, <laughs> right? Because why? We give our kids what they need, not what they want. See, in different seasons of all of our lives, there's different things that we need. Just like growing up, Physically, there's certain things we need as a young child that we don't need as an older person. And then when we get older, there's certain things we need for our body that we didn't need as a younger person. And so there, our bodies are constantly changing, and we give our bodies what, they, what it needs. It'll be healthy and sustainable. But if we do what we want, we find ourselves at a greatly unhealthy place. So what are we going to do? We're going to give them what they need, not what they want. What are we going to do? We're going to give them what they need, not what they want. Okay, so two practical thoughts I want to give to you about giving them what they need versus what they want. The first one is this. Identify the real need in somebody's life. If they come to you and they say, oh, I, I just want to spend more time with you. Maybe what they need is some more friends to spend time with. Just, that's just true. I'm not <laughs> Maybe what they want is they want a new car because they're putting money into an older car, but what they need is to possibly invest in the car they have, fix it up, 
to keep it for longer terms because they're in $25,000 student loan debt and they don't need to add another $15,000 car loan on top of it. What they want versus what they need. Somebody here today, you want to feel special? You want to feel special? You're never going to find feeling special from somebody else. You only feel special through Christ. You only feel special through Christ. So at times you think what you need is, oh, I need to get attention. No, no, no. What you need is you need attention and spend time with Jesus. So number one, identify the real need in people's lives. The second thing is um, pay attention to actions, not just words. Pay attention to their actions, not just words. They say, I need a job. I need a job. I can't get a job, but they haven't looked one place in town to get a job. Their actions say, yeah, you're saying you need a job, but you really aren't looking hard for a job because they're hiring everywhere, right? Exactly. No one will hire me, but yet you put an application at three places, but you won't go put it in a place that's beneath you to work. Your actions speak louder than your words. Here's a big one. No one will date me. But yet you don't go and get in, interacting with good Christian social crowds uh, or you don't take showers and put deodorant on <laughs> or you're living in your mom and dad's basement. Maybe you're signed, you're not finding anybody, so you need to probably think about, hey, I, no one will date me. We'll maybe get out to where people are at and discover how you can go deeper. Why? Because we're going to give people what they need, not what they want. What are we going to do? We're going to give people what they need, what they want. All right, you guys, wake up after this. I want to show you. So next one is this, number two. We're going to set healthy boundaries. Set healthy boundaries. Uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 35 says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place. And what did he do? He prayed. He engaged with God. Jesus showed us very clearly here that he had to set some healthy boundaries about how he was going to do his life. And he knew the way you handle life is you first off spend time with God. You set healthy boundaries. Well, the story goes on to say this. Simon and his friends, um, they went out looking for Jesus. And when they found him, he said, they said to him, they exclaimed actually, everyone is looking for you. Well, obviously, Peter and our Simon Peter and all of his companions, they were trying to figure out what was going on because Jesus had set some healthy boundaries. How many of you guys ever flown on a plane? Flown on a plane, raise your hands up high. Let me see how many you've flown on a plane. All right. Uh, how many guys uh, ever remember what they say about if loss of cabin pressure, what was going to happen? Masks were going to descend from above you, and you are to take the mask, and what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to put it on yourself first, and then assist your family after. Now, I actually watched, a, uh, there was a TV show that actually showed this happening. Husband and wife are on a trip, and uh, they accidentally fell down out of the ceiling. It wasn't really lost a cabin. Accidentally fell down, and he took, and he grabbed his arm. He was sitting there <laughs> like this while his wife just sat there, and she got mad at it. But the reason why this is important is because you can't help someone else if you are not first healthy, if you don't have oxygen in your lungs, you can't help someone else get the oxygen or get the mask on them. And that's what this is about. You have to set healthy boundaries in your life so that you can find revival, you can find renewing, so that you can help other people out. So how? In what areas are we going to set healthy boundaries? Write this down. Two areas I want to give you. Time boundaries. Set time boundaries. What is time boundaries? Hey, can we get together this weekend and hang out? Just want to hang with you. I'd love to do that. Can we get, do that on Saturday from the hours of such and such and such? That would be great. Oh, really? I kind of want to do Sunday. Well, I'm sorry. Sundays is for my family, and that's what I'll be doing on Sundays. But Saturdays, I'm completely open. Set healthy time berries. It's not time boundaries. Hey, can I, I get this all the time. Can I talk to you for a minute? I get five minutes of your time. 
I know that is a lie. It is not five minutes. There's more to it. They want me to spot. And I, will, I have had to learn, even though it's against my, I feel unkind. I feel, I feel like I'm not being very pastorly, but yet I am because what I say is, hey, you know what? This sounds like something. Let's schedule a time this week. Uh, message me, call the church, whatever. We will get something set up. I will make time for you this week. I got 30 minutes. I'm sure somewhere in schedule, I can make that happen. Set healthy time barriers because you do care but you have to also know that there's only so much you can do if you're unhealthy. Second, re- second thing that I want to give you as far as not just time ba- boundaries, but resource boundaries. Say resource boundaries. Let the person that's coming to you, the needy person that's in your life, let them know up front what you can, what you're willing, and what you're capable of doing. Not an open-ended, okay, well, let's go, because you'll find yourself outwardly agreeable and inwardly very resentful because they've overstayed or they've over, over committed, or you're overcommitted your time. So someone says, hey, I just lost my apartment. I need a place to stay. Can I crash at your place? You know what? That would be totally fine. Uh, two weeks, the mo- a month at the most is really all I can do. After that, you're going to have to kind of figure it out on your own. Now, that sounds unloving, but all you're doing is letting them know up front what the expectations are. Someone says, hey, I need financial help. Great. A kid comes to you. A child comes to you struggling financially. You know what? We can help you out. We're going to give you $100 a month for the next three months. But then after that, that's all we can do because that straps us. That's, that's pretty much the max that we can do. Why? Because you need to take care of yourself so you can take care of those others in your life that may need you. Not because you don't care, because you do care. You care enough to set healthy boundaries in your life. So what are we going to do? Number one, we're going to give them what they need, not what they want. And secondly, we're going to what? Set healthy boundaries. Set healthy boundaries. Now, leads me to number three. And, and this third one is the hardest one because sometimes in life, this third one comes into play. Number three is this. We're going to allow them to face their own consequences. This is the one that probably, if you're a loving, kind person, you're gonna be struggling. This is the tension. We have to let them face their own consequences. This is what Galatians 6 Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. Here's what it says. Don't be misled. Remember, you cannot ignore God and get away with it. You will always reap what you sow. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful desires will harvest the consequences of decay and death. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So what's this saying? You reap what you it's the, it's the model that is shown throughout Scripture. It is the biblical way. If you do not work, you do not eat. If it's habitual, over and over again, if you're fully capable of working, get out, get a job, and work. That deserved an applause right there, but <laughs> let me tell you why. You know why we don't? Because we're worried about offending somebody. But hey, scripture says, if a man does not work, he does not eat. Now listen, I didn't make that up. That's God. Take it out on him, (laughs) right? The fact is, are there people that go through hard times? Absolutely. Are there people that hit hardships? Absolutely. I'm not telling you don't help people. I'm not saying don't give to people. But if it's an ongoing thing and they're fully capable to get a job and I can take a rock and throw it out here and hit any place that's hiring, any place, for good wages, not four twenty-five an hour when I started at sixteen. Four twenty-five—that's a happy meal. <laughs> Can't make any money off of that, you know. But this is the way it is. We must allow them to deal with their own consequences. Here's what the, the story I'll summarize real quick. Not going to go into it, but Luke chapter fifteen tells a pr- uh, a, a pretty perfect story for this. The prodigal son. You guys may know it, you may not. Just real quickly, here's how it goes. Two sons, one dad. One of the sons, the younger son, comes to the dad and says, Dad, I know better than you. You're just stupid. 
This is Pastor Kevin's version. This, you won't find this in the Bible, okay? And say that. This is my version. Dad, you're an idiot. You don't know what you're doing with the money. I can do better with it. I want to just go live my life. I want free from you. I know you've raised me. I know you put a roof over my head. Some of you are going to get this because this happened in your home. You put a roof over my head. You took care of me. Whenever, whenever storms were out, I was dry. You fed me. You did everything. But I'm done with you because you're an idiot, and I can do better. So give me my money. And now the dad gave him his money, and he took off. What happened is he partied, he drank, he womanized, he, he did all kinds of, of, of sinful things and lived outside the Father's grace and just did whatever he wanted to do until one day he woke up and he found himself laying face down in a pig trough with pigs and looked at what they were eating and wanted to eat it too because he was starving. Consequences. It was his decision, not the Father's. The father would have done anything in the world to try to keep that son at home and to protect him, but he had to let him have his own consequences. And some of you parents sit here today, unfortunately, that story speaks all too, that hits all too close to home. You've lived, you've loved and lavished on your kids. You've been there for them at every turn. Grandparents and parents, aunts and uncles, you have loved these kids through the hardest times of their life. And what do they do? They turn around, they turn to drugs, they turn to alcohol, they turn to other things to kind of distract them from where it is God wants. You want to rescue them. But let me give you this point. Rescuing isn't always helping. Rescuing isn't always helping. In fact, rescuing at times is enabling them to continue the habitual, repetitive cycle over and over and over again. And let me just be very, 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 very sensitive. It crushes a parent's heart. It's not easy. It's easy if you're not the parent dealing with a kid that's strung out on drugs. But it's not easy when it's your child. It's very hard. It's hard to watch these little ones that we nurtured and loved and was there for when they cut their teeth and their first graduation from kindergarten or preschool and we watch them grow and it's hard to watch them struggle. But remember, rescuing isn't always helping. Sometimes rescuing is the last thing they need because Sometimes tough love is the best love because tough love gets to the heart of where they're at. You see it all the time. Our daughters dating dudes that are dirt balls, scumbags. And we warn them about them. We tell them about them. Don't date them. They're not good for you. They're not good for you. They're going to take you down a wrong path. What do they do? They date them and they get their heart broken. They come back and they're like, I don't know what happened. He's a jerk. And you try to help them every time, back and back and back, and they go back to the relationship, back to the broken relationship, back to the bad relationship, back to the toxic relationship. There comes a point where you just have to say, listen, that's on you. This is, you're a big girl. You can handle this. You're a big boy. This is your deal. I love you. I'm here to do what I can, but I can't do everything you need me to do. So this is where I stop. It's very hard. Don't, don't bail them out. I know whenever I was a child, <clears throat> I overslept a lot for school. And uh, my dad uh, would have to take me to school, me and my sister. I've told this story before, but... It's just kind of appropriate. My dad would have taken us to school, and my dad told me, he said, hey, Kevin, this is small compared to what I just talked about, but it's still nonetheless powerful. He said, if you sleep again, oversleep again, you're going to walk to school. And I thought, there's no way my dad's going to make me walk to school. It's seven miles away. He's not going to make me walk. And I was just a fat kid. He's not going to make a fat kid walk <laughs> to school, right? And I really thought this, and I overslept. Me and my sister overslept, and I, by golly, he did it. Got us up, made us walk. Meanwhile, he followed us in the van the whole way. Now, how many, how, many, how many think I was ever late for school again? 
Anybody? I was never late again. I was never late again. Why? Because sometimes the best love is tough love. And it's drawing a line. If you have somebody in your life that's constantly financially struggling, but they're dealing the things that they're struggling with, they're dealing with, we have this all the time coming to our church. We have people call, I'm talking on a, a daily basis. I need help with electric. I need help with heat. And I need help with uh, this or whatever the, the situation with water or whatever it is. And we are want to be compassionate. We want to help them out the best we can. But there's people that call every single month. And we have to come to a place where we say, you know what? We've done our part. We'll be praying for you. If you need financial help, we actually have, if you need financial help, we have a, a budget person in our church that would love to look over your finances with you. They don't want to do that. No, nope. no, I don't want to do that. I just need the handout. It's the guy at the, the guy by the gate. Just give me the alms, give me the money. I don't really need help. But what happens if we're not careful? These same people that say they need financial help are the same ones that have a bigger screen TV in their house than you do, drive better cars than you do. Just gonna say this, smoke five, 10 packs of cigarettes a day, but they need you to help them with gas to get back and forth to here. Listen, needs are real, needs are real. The tension is when do we step to where we don't always engage and we handicap them instead of letting them get to a better place. Well, bringing all this together, here's number one rule I wanna to give to you today. I wanna to free a lot of you people up today. Here's your number one rule. You ready for this? This isn't even in your notes, this is free. Remember this, you're not the savior. Only Jesus saves. Who's the savior? Jesus. Who's the savior? Jesus. Are you? No. Let me tell you something. If I'm the Savior, I'm going to mess it up every single time. I can't save my kids. I can't save my wife. I can't save any one of you guys. I'm not your Savior. Jesus is the Savior. I learned this a long time ago because, see, as a pastor, you can develop what's called a Savior complex where you think that you're responsible for what people do and decisions they make. I'm not responsible for you. I'm only responsible to communicate to you how to come to the Father, and I point you to the Savior. And that's the only thing you can do. When there's people with deep needs in your life, if, if they're minor and they're incidental, you point them to Jesus. If they're habitual and they're ongoing, you point them to Jesus. He's the Savior. He's the one that can do what only He can do. So don't, can, don't think you're the fixer. Don't think you can make it right. You will fail and you will actually hurt them longer than if you point them to Jesus sooner rather than later. I get, I get passionate because guys, if we get this, if we understand he's the savior, we step out of the way. We're only there if he asks us to step in. We're only there if he says, give $10, give $100. We're only there if he says, okay, you can help them, but we don't force our way in. And we don't say, here I am, here I come to save the day because I am the best one to help you. Because why? I think I'm capable, but we are not capable. I I'm, I'm, I'm just want to, only Jesus can save. Now let me say this. We are moved with compassion but we're not moved to get in the way of what Jesus wants to do. Only he can save. Only he can change. Only he can heal. Bow your heads to me today. Father, would you just help us, Lord? God, I know that there are those in this place who are personally hurting. God, there are those in this place who are hurting in life. There are those parents that are hurting. The scenarios that I talked about today is exactly what they're struggling with. Jesus, would you just go to those parents right now? Go to those grandparents right now, those aunts and uncles. And would you just heal them, comfort them, let them know 
But God, if their heart breaks, how much more your heart breaks. For the children that are far away, for the, for the friends that walk away from you, God. Lord, we pray that you will just heal the broken hearts of those in this room. God, there's others here today that they know of somebody in need, or maybe they've been walking with someone in need, and they've been walking and trying to help them navigate. And God, it's just been hard, and they don't know if they're doing right or they're doing wrong. Holy Spirit, would you just speak to them? In the next few moments of time, help them to, to set healthy boundaries with those individuals those boundaries that will sustain them and make them healthy so, God, they can help other people instead of just two or three, God, many, many, many more. So, Lord, I pray, help us. Help us to cope with the needs in our own life and, God, with the needs of those around us. Give us your wisdom. Give us your strength. And let us know that, God, no matter what we go through, you're always here to be our source.
greatest need that you have here today is you need this Jesus. You've been coming maybe for a few weeks or maybe you've been checking us out online and you come here today and there's something that's drawing you. Your greatest need that you have in your life is Jesus. Jesus, the one who loves you, who cares about you. See, understand this today that this Jesus that we speak about is not just a friend He's not just someone who comes alongside us in our time of needs, but he is our savior. That, that means he saves us from ourselves. He saves us from our sins. He died upon the cross. He lived a sinless life. He died upon the cross, and three days later, he rose again, and he right now is at the right hand of God, and he is believing that you today will make a decision for him. And I don't do this all the time, but today I felt very impressed that your greatest need that you have right now, right here in this place, you don't need another solution. You don't need another answer. You need a savior, a savior to save you from your sins, save you from your wrongs, save you from the place that you have gotten yourself into. And I'm here to tell you this, Jesus, he'll come alongside you, yes, and he'll love you and he'll care for you and help guide you and direct you whenever you get to go down paths that maybe are destructive. He'll be there saying, no, come this way. This is the better way. Come, follow me. So with head bowed and eyes closed today, I just want you to, to just hear my heart today, not to embarrass you, not to call you out, but to give you an opportunity right here, right now to know him to ask him to come into your life, to come into your heart, to help you walk with him every day. You're here today. Your greatest need is Jesus. And you say, I need this Jesus. I need him to forgive me my sins. I need him to come alongside me. I need him to guide my steps. I'm making poor choices. I'm making bad decisions. I'm hurting myself. I'm hurting people around me because of this, this place that I'm at. But I need Jesus to help me. He's my greatest need right now with head bowed, eyes closed. You're here today. You need Jesus more than anything. I want you to boldly just raise your hand right there where you're at. I don't want to pray with you. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be shy. You need Jesus. Raise your hands. Raise your hands. Going up. Going up. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be shy. You need him more than anything. You need Jesus. Hands up. Hands up. Going up. Still going up. Still going up. Just keep them up. I want to pray. Keep going up. Still going up. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, those hands that are raised. Listen, I want you to say this prayer. Say, Jesus, I'm here. And I need you more than anything. Would you, Jesus, just come and be my Savior? Be my hope. I need you, Jesus. I need you to help me every day that I, my thought life and with where I go and where my thoughts go. I need you, Jesus, to be my strength. So, Jesus... Come, be my Savior. I believe, I believe you can save me from who I am. Thank you, Jesus, that you are here. And you, I will always find my salvation. Can we sing that I will rest in you? Sing that part right there. Let us rest in your grace and your mercy. 
save us every single day from ourselves. Watch over us. Let us deal with the needy people in our lives. God, love them to the point, but not, in, not enable them. God, give them exactly what they need because, Jesus, you care more than we do. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. God bless you guys. Have a great day. We'll see you next Sunday.